That was so sweet. Good evening. Okay, wait a minute, we gotta try that again. <laughs> like, when you answer it this time, think about how much you care about the world and how much you care about having your life be a contribution to the world. Good evening. Okay. <laughs> I was about to have to start checking for a pulse. <clears throat> I, I actually don't feel like I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna say very much just because I'd, I feel like I don't really know who all's in this room and the level of involvement you already have in this movement and or the level of questions you have. So I, I'm feeling most present to really just saying just a few things just to kind of stir the soup and then opening it up to everyone who's here for a conversation of whatever is, is most relevant to you, either to share or to ask. Um, <clears throat> yes, I did as far as we are aware, do the largest single war tax resistance in history. I have been stubborn in getting into trouble since I was two years old. And luckily I learned how to direct it into good causes. And uh, I've, I, I work a lot with young people who are struggling in the world today because they too are stubborn and getting into trouble all the time. And one of the things I tell them is, I'm probably one of the few people in life who's gonna tell you that you don't need to change yourself, you just need to change your focus. And it's been very powerful for me to realize that that's all I had to do in my life. Because growing up, I was made to feel bad and wrong for being me. And from the time I was little, I always saw things that didn't settle right in my heart, that didn't settle right in my soul. And I would dare to speak out and I would get punished for doing that. And so I, for, I went through a phase in my life where I became really self-destructive because I didn't see a world where I was allowed to be me. I didn't see a world that honored and respected the things that I felt were important to honor and respect. And so I went through a really self-destructive phase because it was like, why should I even care? And I'm really blessed and grateful that I had an epiphany that said, I, I shouldn't actually give up on my care. If anything, I should just use my stubborn nature and my willingness to get in trouble and head it in the direction of the things that I care about. And uh, that kind of ignited in a very big way in the Lunar Tree Sit and then <clears throat> happened to evolve into war tax resistance or as I call it the redirection. And the way that emerged for me was as was briefly touched on in the film, three corporations stole my image to sell a product. And um, I just didn't think that was acceptable. <laughs> and so I told them, you've made a mistake and now you're going to have to pay. And I said, and you're going to have to pay well because I'm going to donate 100% of my proceeds from this lawsuit settlement and I have a 3,000 person pro bono law firm who's backing me up because they know that by helping me they're going to help all these causes that I'm going to help with the money that you give me. So you better give me a lot of money because I have nothing to lose. And, uh, but because I talked with them and, and, and was really nice and said I'd prefer to like not go through the court system because I don't believe that our court system is a healthy system. I think it's one of the many broken systems in this country. I didn't want to feed that system, so I in invited the companies to work with me outside of the court system. Their New York lawyers took that to mean that I was a pushover. They forgot that I had lived in a tree for two years. <laughs> <laughs> And so they offered me a very, very, very pitiful compensation. And I said, oh, man, now we're going to have to go through this, aren't we? So I filed the lawsuit. And the courts eventually, the judge eventually said to the companies, you have to settle with her. The case is on her side. I don't want you filling up my courts with this case. So settle with this woman. So we eventually did. About four months before I settled, I found out that according to IRS tax law, that this, even though I was giving 100% of this lawsuit away, that it was going to be considered personal income and I would still be taxed on it. <clears throat> and after having this, this 3,000 person t uh, law firm also had very, uh, very good tax attorneys and they did all the creative work they could do and that lowered my tax liability to about $175,000. And that was like the lowest they could get it. And I was really struggling with giving this money to the IRS. And then as we started heading into Iraq, as you see from the film, I just couldn't stomach it. And the team of folks that I work with were not actually supportive. They were concerned about me. They said, you know, Julia, this lawsuit settlement is a gift anyway. You're gonna be able to do so much good. Do you really wanna make this choice? It's gonna have a huge impact on your life. It's potentially gonna impact the kind of work you can do in the world. 
And I sat with it and I prayed on it and I just knew in my heart that I just could not pay this money. It just went against everything that I believe in. <laughs> Thank you. And so I told my team, I'm going to do the research I need to do, not only to make sure that I'm making the most informed decision that I can make, but also doing whatever I can to make those closest to me safe. Because I was, I did have a nonprofit. I was on the board of that nonprofit. I have, you know, I work very much in the public realm. I work very much in the mainstream realm. So I have a lot of kind of moving parts that the average everyday American who looks at making this choice doesn't always have to deal with. Things like event contracts, potential movie contracts, potential book deals, those kinds of things that not everyone has to normally think about in their life. So I, I did what I needed to do. I took myself off the board of my own organization. I created a bunch of roadblocks in between me and all the people I work with to try and keep them safe because I was willing to take the risk, but I wanted to make sure that I wasn't uh, dragging someone else into that risk that was not prepared to take that stand. So once that was all done, filed my taxes and, and basically wrote a big long letter and said, you know, what I said on the film, I'm actually excited to pay my taxes if you were paying them where they belong. But since you don't, I'm going to have to pay them there. And when you're ready to, to pay them where they belong, I'll be happy to start paying taxes again. And then I ended up being drugged through the, the process that happens before you get sent to the final court system. And I actually won over the West Coast regional head of the IRS. And um, he started out not wanting to like me. And then by the time it was done, he said, I'm going to actually recommend that you do an offer and compromise and I'm going to recommend to the IRS that they accept an offer and compromise. Which to me, I was willing to accept partly because the only reason I had this much of a tax liability was because of a lawsuit settlement and I'd already given it all away. So what I would pay in a settlement would literally be pennies on the dollar and I thought I will still have redirected a huge amount of money. I will have made a public stand. I can clear the slate and then just go back to still being a war tax resistor but doing it more below the radar and creatively of you know, living simply. But then it made it to the headquarters of the IRS and they sent me a letter refusing on, based on the fact that I took a political stand and I'm a public figure and therefore it would set a bad precedent. So now with penalties and fees and interest, I owe over $400,000, <laughs> which makes me laugh every time I say it. <laughs> like, bring it on. <laughs> And uh, they, currently in the last few weeks, they've started dragging me back to the, through the system again. For a long, for many years, it's just been a, you know, send me a few threatening letters every year. But now they're going after everybody who I've worked with over the last many years. I'm getting lots of phone calls from people that I know saying, the IRS called me, should we be worried? And, and trying to help them understand what their rights are and, and for them not to worry. It's just the IRS trying to get at me. And I spoke actually to an IRS representative a couple weeks ago, just trying to figure out what was going on, why they all of a sudden reinstated this heavy push. And it turned out she was from the collections department and the people I dealt with before were from the offers and compromise department. Apparently they don't even talk to one another. They don't even <laughs> share files. Because I was talking to this woman, I was like, why don't you just pull up my file? Why are you asking me the same questions I've already been drugged through the system and asked and forced to answer? And she was like, well, I don't have that information. I said, how can you not have that information? And that's when I found out they don't even share file information in their own agency. And I'm like, there you go, wasting our tax dollars again. <laughs> Just on a purely business level, that's a bad business practice to not share files with one another. How much tax dollars are being wasted for you guys to go and redo the same amount of work again? And I was just like, wow, no matter which way you look, this is a bad investment. And I told the woman, I said, I majored in business in college. I learned how to invest money and invest money well. And I have to tell you, whatever way you look at it, you guys are a bad investment. And I said, you know, if you were going to invest in a, in a portfolio investment fund, in a mutual fund, and, and the average person who's actually be paying their money into that mutual fund would look at what the companies are in that fund, what is the a five to 10 year range of the rate of return, like you would do due diligence as a financial investor, but people aren't doing that with their taxes. And why wouldn't I approach my taxes the same way I approach my investments? And I was like, I was like, do you not even think about this? I mean, look at this, you're working in an, in an agency where you guys don't even share files. Like, hello. And um, 
she seemed to be like an automatic rewind play. It didn't matter what approach I, I brought to her, she just kind of repeated the same line that she had just said. So I was like, okay, this isn't getting very far and I'm getting bored and you're starting to annoy me. And I said, well, here's the thing. I have a bicycle and some really cool kitchen supplies. <laughs> if you would like to come get those, come find where they are. Otherwise, have a great day and I'm done with this conversation. So that was uh, the last of my interaction with them. We'll see when I get back to California what's waiting for me there. Um, and overall, it's just been, it's been amazing for me because I had this epiphany actually while I was in the tree under the Clinton era when we were, went into Yugoslavia and, and were bombing there. And I was hearing reports from the tree of people running out onto bridges with their t-shirts painted with a bullseye on it, trying to let people know that innocent people were the targets in this war. And the infrastructure that people relied on for their survival, electricity, you know, energy, water, infrastructure like bridges so they can get out uh, when, the, when the bombs are dropping, that we were bombing even the bridges, so then they were literally stuck as targets. And I'd heard about that when I was in the tree, and uh, I prayed and I called my ground support and I said, we need to do something in solidarity with this. And I asked them to paint a really big bullseye on a, on a sheet. And then I, they brought that up and I hung it from the top of the tree and had a flyover photographer and I sent out a press release and the quote was, in the war of politics, power and profit, all of life becomes a target. And I was trying to make that intersection in people's minds that, that there's a war on the planet and there's a war on people and it's connected. And so I see my war tax redirection not only directly related to the actual dropping of bombs and things like that, but I look at it as a lot of our tax dollars also goes to many different forms of violence against the planet and all of her beings. And anywhere money is paying for violence, I do my very best to redirect that, including in my everyday life. Like, I see the disposability consciousness of our country as a form of very severe violence. And every paper plate, paper napkin, paper towel, paper bag, plastic bag, plastic to go container, plastic utensils, all those things that are a part of our daily unconscious behavior, that is a form of violence and war against the planet. And so I practice it even in my daily life. I don't participate in disposability consciousness to the best of my ability, because if I want to demand change of others, I have to be willing to live it in my life. And it doesn't mean that I'm perfect, and it doesn't mean that I'm asking others to be perfect, but I am, I am a committed stand that I do the best with my life to live my vision that I have for the world. If I want my vision to exist, it can only exist through how I show up. And, and I make a lot of mistakes because I'm a human being, and that just seems to come with the territory. <laughs> no matter how hard I try to be something other than human, I just keep being stuck being human. So I do the best that I can with the limitations of being human in an imperfect world. But my commitment is to look inside of myself and say, what is my vision of the world? And then head in that direction to the best of my ability with every thought, word, and action. So when it came time to make this choice around the money, with the lawsuit settlement, as intense as it was, because there, there isn't precedent in the war tax resistant movement for this level of redirection. So as much research as I did, I was still the guinea pig and a lot of people were excited. They're like, we hope you choose to do this, Julie. We want to see what happens. <laughs> and as intense as it was to take this on, it, it felt for me the same way as when I knew that I had to stay in the tree and not come down. And I call it the choiceless choice. At certain points in our lives, all of us come up against choices and we reach that point where we could choose to be silent, where we could choose to walk away. In the case of paying taxes, we could choose to pay for war. But something inside of ourselves calls out louder and says, no, that's not the choice for me. I have to follow this choice even if it's difficult, even if it's dangerous, even if it's scary, because the calling in my soul is so loud that I, I have to follow it no matter what. And that's what called me into, into taking this action. And uh, that's what calls me to the work I do. And that's what calls me to be with you all here tonight. And I know that many of you in this room, if not all of you, are, are already practicing war tax redirection. And I honor you for that. And I thank you for that. I tell people all the time, both my tree sit and this action, I tend to do things big, but I'm clear that I don't do them alone. 
I'm, I'm, I'm a part of a movement and how blessed I am that I'm a part of a movement that has such a long and rich and beautiful tradition as we got just a taste of in the film. And I know that many of you are part of that long and rich and beautiful tradition and I'm profoundly honored to be a part of that, that movement towards peace, towards beauty, towards love that we all collectively move in in this work. And with that, I will close my mouth and uh, open it up to you to share or to ask whatever is present for you. Or not, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start your name there. Um, so you said something I really liked about uh, doing the best you can, but you're not perfect and you don't expect others to be perfect. Um, Have you found a way to communicate like our passion around uh, environmentalism or feminism or peace, peace activism or whatever we choose without putting people off with the like how do we share that we're not looking for people to be perfect, that we're not trying to be better? Right. Well, you did a great job in the film. It was fun. I got to meet Jesse before. This is the first time both of us saw the film, so we were like, we're going to our premiere, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's so interesting because first and foremost we have to recognize that in this country there's a listening of I'm being accused, I'm being judged, you're right, I'm wrong, or I have to be right and you have to be wrong, right? So like that's kind of the collective listening in our country so we have to recognize that no matter how careful we are about what we communicate and how we communicate, we're communicating into the space of people already listening in a very particular way. And it's a listening that's a voice inside of all of our heads. And it's one that I'm aware of that happens with me all the time. So luckily, I'm aware enough to check myself and ask myself, what kind of listening am I having in this moment? But I've been blessed to do this kind of work and be called on this journey of doing the personal work as I'm doing the global work. So I'm, I have some insights that maybe not everyone has if they're not in that inquiry. <clears throat> but I have learned some a few great key tips along the way and it doesn't hurt to literally have your life on the line to learn some lessons <laughs> and so in the tree my life was literally threatened more than once including with loggers who were trying to kill me and in the beginning i was like trying to talk to them about logging and they would say f you and then start their chainsaws and i started realizing that i wasn't being very effective <laughs> and uh I had this great, great insight in that moment of I had to make a choice. Am I more committed to being connected or am I more committed to being right? And it was really profound for me because we're right a lot and there's probably a reason why we're not further along. Because if we have right on our side, why aren't we further along? Because unfortunately, my experience has been that oftentimes the way right is communicated is communicated with judgment. And one of my experiences in the tree, actually dealing with activists, there was this day we were planning, I was obviously part of the meeting by phone, everybody else was on the ground, and we were planning an action, and wouldn't you know it, a divergence of opinions on how to, deal, how to carry out the action happened. And then all of a sudden I was listening to people and people's voices were raising and they were belittling one another and calling each other names like, that's a stupid idea, why would you do that? And you know, that kind of behavior. And I heard in people's voices chainsaws. And I had this epiphany of how in the world do we think we're gonna stop the clear cutting of the forest if we're so incredibly effective at clear cutting one another. And it was so profound for me that I got that insight of like judgment kills off connection. And I realized in that moment actually, when I realized that I was in the tree for more than just trees, I realized in that moment that I tell people I don't, I very rarely use the term activist to describe myself. I, I, when I'm talking to people, I say I'm a holistic health practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> And because that's really what I'm committed to is that holistic health, that whole systems thinking. And what I realized in that interaction with the activists and then witnessing the logging and seeing all these things playing out, including the war in Yugoslavia, now the war in Iraq, that every issue is just a symptom of the disease. It's not the disease itself. The disease is the disease of disconnect. If we're disconnected from the forest, we can clear cut it and not think about what we're doing to animals, to water, to future generations. When we're disconnected from people in places like Iraq, we can drop a bomb on them and call them a statistic instead of feeling that they're a human being 
just like us, and there's some kind of a connection there. So that helped me realize that in the form of in realm of communication, I have to ask myself, where is the possible pathway to connection? I have some things I'm passionate about. I'm obviously opinionated, <laughs> you know, but is there a pathway of communicating that can create connection versus disconnect? Is there a way for me to get outside of my own view and into their worldview and see if there's a way that I can share that reaches out to them instead of demanding that they first reach out to me? And it doesn't always work, obviously, <laughs> if only. Uh, but it, it, it certainly helps. And then the other, another great strategy I learned was humor. It's amazing how well humor works. <laughs> the issues we're facing are serious. They're not funny. You know, watching footage of people being blown into bits. You know, I mean, the minute I go there to that footage in my mind, the tears come because I'm like, I've seen pictures of you know moms and fathers holding their their children who've been blown apart in their arms, and it brings up this kind of grief because I just can't believe that we can do that to one another. And so we face this kind of intensity, whatever we care about. For me, I face it on a daily basis because I tend to care about everything. So I, I hurt pretty much every day. And when we reach that that point, these issues are so serious, they're so painful that sometimes we lose the magic of life. We lose that every time we take a breath, a miracle just happened. And if I can get present to the miracle of my life, then the joy returns. When the joy returns, the humor is soon to follow. And I have found, just like in this, like the minute I say joy and humor, my joy is coming back. I can hold the space for both deep grief and deep joy. And what I have found with humor is that it helps dispel and, and uh, disperse the listening of others of like I'm being judged now. When I became famous for sitting in a tree, there was a lot of kind of already figured out stereotypes about me. And so I learned that one of my greatest tools was just to make fun of myself. And I tell people now when they start making fun of me, I'm like, come on, I lived in a tree <laughs> for two years. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> And I lived in a tree by myself for two years. I'm better at making fun of me than you will ever be. So bring it on. So I found that like being willing to use humor and creativity, as we saw in the film, the various forms of creativity, I feel that these are some of the tools that we all have in our toolbox that help shift the listening such that we might bring forth our information in a way that can be received. And it's not always received, but I found that those three things, looking for myself, how can I make a connection? being willing to be mindful of my own judgments and being willing to utilize humor and creativity in the face of deep pain and suffering that those are critical pieces that i found in, in being able to reach out thanks yeah um i have a the tax resistance process is sort of characterized as, as, like, as that as a process you kind of go go forward with what kind of resources are there maybe that you know about or just the overall community would know about to let somebody know, uh, you know, what they might expect, you know, at different stages in that process and then depending on different, like, lifestyles or whatever their, their circumstances are. So, like, as somebody who's just been doing this, like, on my own, almost, like, as a secret for everyone, like, never thought about it as, like, a community movement. So I'm interested in, like, I understand why you do it. I'm just more interested in, like, actually like how can how can somebody help me understand what I'm getting into? Great. Well I think yeah. you would answer that. <laughs> because there's there's some very clear online resources and books. So but you can tell a little bit about what you did and then I could tell about New York City. But you want to say a little bit about Well I I mean what I did was I went online and uh, there's a wealth of information online because one of the great things this movement has track as much as possible of the people who will, were willing to do it in a public way, keeping track of what were the impacts, just like it's kind of shown in the video, and what were the different choices that various people have made, and what were the impacts or non-impacts of those choices. So there's a ton of that information online, um, which is where I got a lot of my information. And then I actually talked to people who are war tax resistors or redirectors and asked them, what is your experience? What are the things I should be mindful of? What are the kind of things I should be thinking of in my redirection? Those kinds of things, um, which I think is across the board. But I know that Ruth has got very specific kind of tools because that's 
that's part of what they're here for. This is one of the groups that I tapped into when I said, okay, I want to make this choice, and I got information that made a big difference for me. Yeah, I think we probably, I don't know, have a range of um, information in the room. Some people a long time, more tax resistors, but some of you may be totally new. And uh, we do have a lot of literature on the table over there. So definitely um, visit the, the table there. There are lots of brochures and introductory pieces of information. Um, National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee is uh, a network of the groups around the country that work on war tax resistance. So in New York City, um, we don't really call ourselves by a group name, but there are a lot of war tax resistors here. We mostly work through New York City War Resistors League, and um, we do have workshops. I usually um, <coughs> in the spring or before tax day, but actually we didn't quite fit a real workshop in this year. So um, we have a sign-up sheet over there, and if people, you know, if people want to sign up and put a star, we will do a workshop in New York and get in touch with you um, for that, because I think it helps to come to a workshop and uh, hear from other people and hear what's going on. Um, and then we tend to get together a few times a year at support meetings or you know whatever questions people have, that kind of thing. Um, and Julia has intersected with the Northern California War Tax Resistance Group at times in the Bay Area. And I think you saw quite a few of the different groups noted in the film. So Sonoma County and uh, Pioneer Valley War Tax Resistance is up in Western Mass. So there are quite a few groups in our network around the country. So wherever you are, there's usually somebody out there too. And National War Tax Resistance tries to connect people. Um, so it's kind of a loose and whatever. War Resistors League is one of the national organizations which has had war tax resistance on its agenda for um, uh, years, since the 50s or before, I guess, 40s, I guess. Uh, some of the first war tax resistors were also connected to War Resistors League. So there's a book that um, on war tax resistance that was published by War Resistors League. And Ed standing over there was the author of that book, actually. So um, there's a lot of information. But um, on the one hand, this isn't a workshop. On the other hand, you know, people should, you know, if you want to ask questions afterwards, you can also ask some of us some of the, the war tax resistance specifics. Does that, does that help you to know that there's some yeah, real resources here? I think here? that probably talking to individuals in the space, particularly what you were talking about, uh, having like people who you know get in front of and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then like ideas about like what, whether or not you want to make certain like kind of financial decisions in the future, like what you want to do, like things like that. So right. So I guess we're just talking to individuals. <clears throat> Yeah, that's great, and especially because you're here. There's, there's quite a few folks here tonight who have been involved in this, so it helps to talk to individuals. And like I said, online and, and in the pamphlets that they have, there's so much. Thank goodness there's, there was some thinking behind let's kind of keep track and so that people can kind of see there's various levels of of choosing to redi redirect and or resist. And these are, this is the feedback loop we have around what's been the, the impact of these choices. So it's helpful. And of course, one of the things everyone will tell you is there's no for sure thing, you know, <clears throat> because the, the laws very rarely make sense anyway. So who are we to think that all of a sudden they'll start making sense for war tax resistance um, or redirection? But it certainly helps to kind of have a better overview of it. So that table's full of a ton of information and a lot of the local folks and getting connected in with the local group, it would be great. Thanks. Yes. I'd like to offer an additional response to Jesse's question. I went to a presentation by a group, uh, by people from a group called Smart Mean, and what their thing is, not arguing with facts, but telling stories, mm -hmm. framing the issue in terms of a story that people can really grab onto. Mm -hmm. And sitting in a tree is a great story, <laughs> obviously, because everybody wants to rip it off. But Randy and Betsy also, mm -hmm a good story. And I think we all have how we came to the issue, how we uh, uh, worked out how, how to do, do it, struggle with it. One thing I like to do when I meet people whenever the issue is to ask them how they got involved. And that's you know, usually a great story too. So um, it's something that um, you know, can be applied to any issue. I haven't read the book yet. There is a book. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, telling stories is the best. Very best. There's three in the back, so we can go in either direction. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I hope that this is appropriate to mention, if not, then just cut, cut 
me off, but I actually ended up here because I met Vicky on the street the other night. She, she wrote a book about all the public restrooms in New York, <laughs> speaking of books, and she told me that I could get 30 copies of it to give out to some friends, so I went to the War Resisters really earlier today, um, and then I saw the poster that, that you were speaking, and um, I, I've been tremendously influenced by a sh short little video that you, you talked a little bit about with the chainsaws. And I think I just found it on Google to Julia Hill Pro and just talking about what there, there's the, op the counterbalance of the things that we're resisting is to talk about the things that, that we're for and the beauty and the, the peace that we envision. And I think that in my estimation, a lot of times the, the resistance it gets so busy resisting that it also loses sight of um, how to set up better models to say this is what we should be spending our money <coughs> on, and this is where we sh should be investing our, our resources. Anyway, I, I have a a positive vision petition I won't get into now. If you want to come and ask me what it's about, um, I have it here in, in the back. And, um, but if, if you could just talk a little bit more about the, the probe. Sure. Well, that's one of the great things I was actually excited to hear about was the People's Life Fund. Uh, was started by war tax resistors and redirectors uh, partly to support people if they go through this process and something happens and they need support, that there was actually like a how do we create a collective support system both via through people but also through finances. If somebody gets a drug through the court system or faces losing their house, what kind of support systems can we build as a movement so that we're actually caring for one another as we're working to care for the planet and for the world. So that's, that's something that's already in place. And then also, as we saw in this video, um, there's, there's the People's Life Funds across the country are investing in the things that are happening in their community that are moving that community towards peace, whether it's around food or um, homes or the homeless, or the kind of things that our collective tax dollars should be going for, which is caring for the earth and caring for one another. So luckily within the movement, there is already kind of a, a focus on well, what is working at the same time as focusing again what's not working. <clears throat> but it is, a, it is really important th remembering that piece because, you know, the reality is we can close our eyes and spin in any direction and when we open them we're going to be looking at something that's not working. <laughs> we've, we've created a system that is really, really destructive and it's showing up, those symptoms of that disease of disconnect are showing up everywhere. So it's actually easy to point out what's wrong. And it can be a little harder to point out what's right and how to make it work, especially because anywhere in the natural world we look, diversity is crucial to the vitality and thrivability of that system. And yet oftentimes when we get involved in an issue without even realizing it, we start demanding a monoculture of thinking in our movement as we're demanding diversity in our world. So it can be a little bit of a challenge when folks have a slightly different ideological views or willingness of risks that they're willing to take or these kind of things that that we get diversity elsewhere but then it comes to the movement no you have to think this way act this way speak this way hold this line and all of a sudden it's like but wait a minute if a monoculture isn't healthy on the planet then how can a monoculture of thinking in our movement be healthy either so it's really important that <clears throat> for me that as we as we look at when we're thinking about what we are for, that we really embrace the diversity of opinions and thoughts and, and ways of expressing what we care about. Um, because otherwise, it's very easy for what we are against to begin to define us and how we interact and how we act and even the directions we head in. There's something about the saying of like, all race car drivers know you, you go where, you, you steer where you look. <clears throat> and so they know that like, they, if you're on that racetrack, you better not look even a second off or you're going to be <laughs> off in that direction. And so we're on a pretty intense track of trying to steer our, our human family around with the question of do we have enough time? We're headed pretty fast, fast paced towards a cliff. Are we going to be able to turn this 
this collective vehicle in time. And so we have to realize that if we're trying to get us over there, but we spend too much time looking over here, we shouldn't be surprised that we end up over here. And so it is, it is an important thing to remember. Yes, we do need to speak out against what we are against. We do need to hold others accountable. But at the same time, we actually have to have a vision and a strategy and a movement that is more powerful, that has more energy going into it so that it calls us to head in the direction where we're hoping to move as a collective humanity. Thanks for that. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I'll uh, say that uh, we should be too harsh on judgmental people. We should be too judgmental about them. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and on the other hand, we shouldn't uh, uh, assume that we have the obligation to bend our shape to translate our <coughs> message to the dumbest people or the cruelest people so that we can win them over. That, that we shouldn't accept that kind of assignment. But uh, this is just, a, I don't want to go uh, into it, uh, taking up too much of your time. I have a serious question. If some people opted not to be part of this empire, if, if they said, okay, the, my house is going to be sold eventually, I may as well sell it now, and go to another country, would this uh, be an option? I mean, would IRS uh, catch up with it immediately? Or, or let's say uh, somebody uh, produces a movie here which generates income, and the person gets out of this country, would that person be able to, I don't know, uh, get that money somehow, or would the IRS immediately grab it? How would it work, you know, once somebody was with his or her feet and becomes a citizen of another country? Well, the research that I've done is that <clears throat> the answer to that question can head in a million different directions. Part there's, if you look at corporations, they set up all kinds of shelters that allows them to redirect their money and keep it safe. So a lot of it has to do with how savvy you are, where you redirect it, how, what kind of systems you set up, if you set up certain kind of trusts. There's all kinds of ways that you can do it, <clears throat> just like corporations do all the time. Um, but that would, there, there's not... A plus B equals C in the answer to this question because it literally depends on so many different moving parts based on specifically there's a difference between if you're trying to sell a house and if you have a movie. There's a difference on if you're just trying to take your money and run versus if you're directing your money towards good things. There's a lot, a lot of different potentials based on the choices that you make along the way. And again, there's a lot of information in the booklets here and there's people including um, the folks based here in New York who could have uh, a deeper conversation with you sp around a sp like what specifically are you looking to do that could help you specifically achieve the results you're trying to achieve. But there's too many variables to have a direct answer to that one question. Is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, no. Huh? Okay. <laughs> yes. This guy has been off, but it's more directed to what something you had mentioned. I imagine that you were start a nonprofit or you're on the board of a nonprofit and that you would take yourself off the board. I thought I'm kind of just getting into this now, but I kind of thought the point of a nonprofit, like an official you would kind of incorporate with the state and it kind of shields that organization from whatever kind of personal issues you may have, whatever kind of personal liability you may incur. Mm -hmm. Why did you have to do that? Or why did you choose to I chose to do that because a nonprofit is a corporate structure, but it's not an LLC. It's not a limited liability corporation. It's a totally different tax structure. 501c3s are very, very different from an LLC. And an LLC is what protects the corporation from the behaviors of the individuals. But that's a very specific structure that actually nonprofits are not allowed to have. Nonprofits were actually started by the government because the government didn't want to do its job. <laughs> and it didn't want to use the money it was given to do its job. So it came up with this really creative thing called, we'll give some people some tax breaks and have these community-based organizations who will do way more work than we'll ever do because we're lazy. <laughs> And, uh, and we'll give them a corporate structure so that there's a lot of rules and regulations, but we don't actually, nonprofits don't actually receive the same kind of benefits that most corporate structures receive. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I majored in business in college, so it's like I'm actually passionate about this. And I bring, like, I'm more interested in bringing the quote unquote not for profit values into the for profit world. Um, and, and I 
have run both the nonprofits that I started as well as the nonprofits that I've supported in helping them strategically think like a business so that they become less and less dependent on the handouts of others so that they can really succeed with what they're up to. But that's why I had to do things like take myself off the board because I, <clears throat> excuse me, because a 501c3, which is the legal name for a nonprofit, a 501c3 does not receive the same limited liability benefits that other corporations receive. So the IRS could have actually gone after the organization? Yeah, and what's actually more dangerous is they would go after the people who are on the board of a nonprofit are legally liable for the behaviors of that nonprofit. And even if you have insurance, which we had, um, it creates too much risk, including the fact that it could just drag them into years and years and years of court. And that's not fair. Like, I don't want anybody in my life, I'm willing to do that, I'm like, bring it on. Cause you know, I'm just gonna be like, spouting off whatever I care about in front of the cameras. You know, I'm, I'm like, call me into jail, I'll teach yoga. You know, like, I'll do something, whatever they do to me, I'll be doing something that I believe in. So I like, bring it on. But I approach things a little differently than other people. And some people on my board at the time, like have a house, have kids, you know, <clears throat> they can't have their whole life be redirected into years and years and years defending themselves in court. So that's why I took myself off the board. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Yes, sir. You had. Hi. I was watching 13, and that's how I heard about you. And 13. It's, What's 13? Uh, it's, oh, a, it's like a non kind of cable, okay. non kind of corporate, but now it's totally corporate. Now they have oil commercials on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a long time ago, and I said, anybody would stay in a tree for two years knowing they might cut it down and kill them, uh, has to be somebody real. Uh, so I was really inspired by what you were doing because I'm more of an anarchist. I don't really believe in wasting my time in court, some cops and all that. It's like, if you want to save the trees, do direct action and save the tree from your heart, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what you do, just do it. Mm. So I was like, there's a person who should really believe because I knew people that were involved in that type of stuff in the 90s and they were doing stuff like that. And two of them got subpoenaed to, be, to talk, rat everybody out. We flew them into Michigan to talk, and I would have people they would have read it out. Because I was an anarchist at the time. I was wondering, do you, do you think there was any infiltration or any attempts of that? I'm sure you know by Judy Bear. So yeah. Bob, if you're underneath the car, maybe you should talk about it if you want to. Good to be, if you knew her at all. And she, I realized uh, also, if you ever heard of Lynn Stewart, uh, I, we want to try to do an event in July. She's a people's lawyer who was framed by the government. She, uh, helped, she helped a lot of Black Panthers in the 60s. Oh, right. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to do uh, like a tour with, him, with uh, Ralph. And today they're doing, uh, in Washington, an event for Mia Bujma, a Black Panther, who was framed for throwing a cop. So what I've been trying to tell the environmentalists is we have to start working with the people in these concrete cities. And these people that don't even know anything about that type of stuff. It's, uh, start working together. And I don't know if we I mean, were in Washington for Sydney Sheen. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you ever got to talk to her or met her, but she has a book called Peace Mom. Amazing lady. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was there, she got arrested, but I had to go back on a bus, but I was like, this seems to me a disconnect with the movement because we all should have just stayed there until she got released. Mm -hmm. But the movements are so disorganized, <coughs> it's like socialists will only go to socialist conferences, anarchists won't even talk to socialists. Libertarians will talk to anybody else. And it's like all divided now. I'm like, why don't we work together like people are used to? And Zachary and Zeddy had 20,000 people at the funeral for Zachary and Zeddy. And I'm like, you kind of remind me of like, that's what Zachary and Zeddy would do. If they were in the tree trying to save trees, that's, they would probably sit in the tree for 10 years instead of worrying about the court. So uh, I don't think we ran into life, but if we can keep in contact, if you get Ralph's number, if you can make a call in before the leave or if you can. And I love to do something like that with you. And um, where do you get your inspiration? Is it strictly spiritual? Or? <laughs> well, I, I, I meant it like uh, my brother. You know, I'm pretty sure he's like from A to Z and somewhere beyond that. I'm not sure where <laughs> <laughs> you know, How did you decide one day that you're passing and you up in a tree and you had the spirit to like withstand the wind? Because like, your video was amazing. The video you had up there. What was like, what kept you going? Well, I, I definitely, you know, I do feel like we need to do a better job of working with one another across the symptoms of the disease. And part of the challenge in doing that cross-building work is that we are all 
living with various levels of symptoms of the disease. And so it makes, because we have all these different levels of disconnect, it's hard to work on connection at the same time as we're also working on our own symptomatic responses to the disease of disconnect. I've been really blessed to be able to do a lot of work that crosses the perceived boundaries, and it's not easy. I mean, the amount of times that I have had to stand in the middle of a, a verbal onslaught of the intensity of people that we should be, ally, should be allies with just because there's a legacy of a lot of grief and pain and rage and sometimes you symbolize that legacy and so you just gotta take it and and at the same time like learning how to take it but not feed it and not say that it's okay that I'm not I'm not that I might be part of you know that legacy but I'm not that and I won't I won't show up like that I won't I won't play guilt game I won't play lesser than game I will play let's figure out how to play together as a team and let's play together as a diverse team but so it can be really intense because there's a there can be very real challenges every ist in ism has a huge legacy of disconnect attached to it and so when we try and work across and through the ists and the isms, what comes to the table first is that huge legacy of disconnect. And somehow we have to find a way to stick with it and remain loving and connected in the face of some very real intense stuff that comes up. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But luckily, I happen to be a little more stubborn, so I'll stick it out longer than the average person will. <laughs> and I'll come right to you, yes. And then, um, to answer the, the, the piece about, uh, I think that also, who, whatever we're passionate about, I, th I personally feel that it's really, it really is important if I want someone to work with me that I have to be as equally committed to working with them. And I have to instead say, I need you to work on this with me. I have to show up and say, how can I bring who I am, the resources that I have and what I care about, how can I bring it to bear with you? How can I bring it to support you and what's important to you? And, and I've found that actually to be more effective in achieving the goals that I want to achieve than just saying, hey, everybody, you need to jump on my bandwagon because everybody's got their bandwagon. <laughs> and it's like, I can't be on that bandwagon this one, so have a great day. I'm off over here. Uh, and then the piece about inspiration, I. It varies from day to day, but I have found that we always get what we look for, always. So if I wake up in a bad mood and I'm not careful, I'm gonna have a full day's worth of proof of why I have every right to be in a bad mood. <laughs> and then the same is true for inspiration. If I look for things to be inspired by, then that's what I get. And uh, I mean, the thing that I, I'm most present to in this moment is there was, I was going to do an event and the organizer for the event was very unorganized, which happens sometimes. And because I sometimes am very, very busy, and there are days where I have three or four events in a day, and interviews, and logistics of getting from point A to point B, and trying to find time to get something to eat in the middle of all that. So there are certain days where my bandwidth of like team spirit is a little smaller than other days. <laughs> and so I was going to this event, and this organizer was so unorganized that they didn't even give me the address of the event the next day until like 12.30 in the morning. So I'm in San Francisco, I'm at the BART station, the public transportation system there, and I'm so agitated, you know, I just woke up kind of a little pissy, and I'm just like, I'm just back, back. I can't believe this person didn't even send me the address and this event is going to be terrible, why am I even wasting my time, you know, just... <laughs> And so all of a sudden, as I'm marching back and forth, I notice this little color out of my eyes, and I slow down, and I realize it's these little tiny white flowers growing out of the crack between the concrete and the metal band next to it where the BART train station pulls up. And it taught me in that moment, because I'm committed to finding things to be inspired by, even if my grumpalumpalus, as I call it, <laughs> is making a bunch of noise. And I stopped, and I was like, I realized what this thing was teaching me and I literally bent down, I touched the flowers, I said thank you and I started to cry because I was so present to in that moment. These are flowers growing out of a freaking crack between some cement and a piece of metal with a BART train running by <laughs> over and over and all day. People just stomping on it, not even noticing that there's flowers and the flowers aren't there moaning and groaning that they're not in the field with a bunch of sunshine and some crisp clean air blowing over them. They're just being flowers in the crack in the concrete with people stomping on him. Nobody cares, I'm gonna be a flower anyway. <laughs> and so in that moment, I'm like, it got me present to the gift of my life. Like, why am I wasting my time moaning and groaning about 
some logistical problems. Yes, it wasn't easy. It wasn't, I was not necessarily set up for success that day, but why waste the miracle of my life moaning about that when a flower can be a flower in a crack on the concrete next to the BART station? So to me, I feel like the inspiration comes not, it does come externally, but it more comes from, am I committed to being inspired? Am I committed to being grumpy and upset? I'll get a whole lot of reasons to be that. But if I'm committed to being inspired, then that's what I'll find. I call it glasses. I just put on my inspiration glasses and look for inspiration. <laughs> what did they tell you to cut that up tree in the video? You can describe that. that. I'm sorry, what? On the video, when they showed you, they talked about sometimes they were trying to let them get the food up to you when they started <clears throat> to cut down the tree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got shot at. I got a twin propeller helicopter with 300 mile an hour updraft, 75 feet above my head trying to blow me out. I had trees cut at the tree I was in, hitting the tree I was in with other trees trying to knock me out. Yeah, all kinds of things. Since coming down the ground, I've had a lot of the same things. Guns pulled on me, knives thrown at me. Mm -hmm. Because I've become a symbol. And people attack symbols for what they stand for. And when people do that, it is their fear in the space. They are afraid of what the symbol stands for. And they, are, they don't see me as a person. They see me as a symbol that needs to be taken down. But I'm just, I, you know, at some point, we're all going to die. I tell people the surest way to die is to get born. <laughs> so why not ask ourselves, what do we want to do with the gift that comes in the middle of those two things? <laughs> we don't know how long we're going to be here. So why not, like, I'm committed to, like, juicing my life like that peach off of a tree in Georgia on a hot afternoon, you know? <laughs> Just like, I want, it, I want my life dripping down my chin and down my arm. I want to juice it for all it's worth because all I get is... And an undescribed, undefined amount of time called a gift between the moment I'm born and the moment I die. And I, I'm the one who gets to decide what that gift looks like. I, I can play victim and say it has to do with everyone else, or I can say, it's my life. I'm going to do the best I can with it. That's what I do. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I. Uh with the Wars is just League too, and I really honored, uh, you know, W.R. West, so we met in San Francisco a couple of times, and it was nice to see you again. But, um, you know, I've been really struck with Earth Day and the whole Copenhagen, and everyone's concerned about climate change, and yet environmentalists, and, you know, on Democracy Now!, or wherever I'm reading or, or watching, people don't talk about the anti uh, environmental aspects of the military, the U.S. military in particular. People are talking about what we can do and everything, and it's just kind of off the scale what actually the U.S. military is doing. I mean, we're working to update an old flyer called Superpower Super Polluter, so from like 10 years ago. Um, writings by different people about the fake environmentalism of the military and trying to portray themselves as stewards of the land. And um, and yet, so I'm, I'm kind of curious your comments on the balancing of personal integrity around, you know, <coughs> reuse, you know, carrying a cup around and a spoon and all and trying to minimize that. And, and yet really, it's off the scale. And so to be an anti-militarist really is an, envir is an environmental thing. And if we ignore the military, basically, it almost doesn't matter because it's dropping the bucket. So I don't know, I'm just kind of, I want to, Thank you for being a an environmentalist and a peace nick and an anti-militarist because the tax resistance is anti-war and then anti-military is more specific and um, just where you see us needing to go like constructive program but at the same time still needing to challenge even bigger stuff because even the environmental groups aren't talking about the military. Can I just quickly add to that? What if everybody didn't pay their taxes and we found that the wars are still being funded another way? We're not looking at the capital assets and the secret books. And that actually the IRS is just a function of a declining government that's not protecting us from about 40 Euro space industries that came in here, started with 9-11, worked through Goldman Sachs, and now we're... And it's been happening long before that. I mean, what, what, these, what these comments really point to is connected.
<laughs> no, really, it's all connected. And that can be both the gift and the challenge, right? So it's like, for me, it's not an either or conversation of personal accountability versus corporate or militaristic or governmental accountability. It's a both and conversation. And for me, it's about, because integrity to me is crucial in my effectiveness. Why? Because integrity is not about moralism or self-righteousness or any, or judgment. Integrity shares the same root word as integral. It means, how things are connected. So they're either connected or they're not. And so for me, I can't, my, our foundation that we stand in, the integrity of our foundation, anybody who's building a house knows that the integrity of the foundation is vital to the stability of the house. You can put all kinds of support beams in the house and if the integrity of the foundation's weak, the thing's coming down. And so for me, my personal choices of integrity are about making sure that I build as solid of a foundation as I can, knowing that I don't have a perfect choice. I mean, think about all the resources that went into my stainless steel bottle. I mean, I'm clear that there's not, you know, it's, it, there's, a, there's an impact for every choice and there's no such thing as a perfect choice. But to the best of my ability, anytime I have a new insight or learning, I'm trying to integrate that into my daily practice so that my foundation becomes even more solid so that I can take a very real stand against the things that aren't working and for the things that I want to see happening. <clears throat> and I do feel that that's, that's important and that really a lot of these questions and, and comments and sharings that have come up all night are just reminders of that, no, it really is all connected. You can't pull one thread out and just have that one thread. It is that interwovenness. Why? Because we all share the same planet, island Earth, in the great cosmos of the universe that's beyond what we could imagine, and it's all connected. We're even connected to the stratosphere because all this stuff happens out there that causes weather patterns that then we create actions that causes weather patterns, and now we have this thing called global climate change. You know, like, pick an issue, there's a cause and effect that comes right back. So, it, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I feel sad sometimes that of how, how n very rarely people do approach things from a whole systems approach. Like that, you know, that's kind of the way I approach it. I'm like, I'm a joyous vegan because I want to make my footprint on this planet as light as possible. And I'm also the, but I'm also the person who says, if you live in Alaska, not a great idea to be vegan for a huge chunk of the year because the globe, the carbon footprint of being a vegan in Alaska during many months of the year is actually a non-vegan choice. So vegans even trip out on me. They don't know how to handle me. I'm like this radical vegan, vegan who supports protection of, you know, this habitat for the wild salmon in Alaska so that people can subsist from where they live. And it's like, wait, dude, that doesn't compute. And that doesn't compute from, from fundamentalist view but from a whole systems approach, it does. And so I'm like everything I'm looking at, I try to the best of my ability approach it from a whole systems approach that says, there's no such thing as a perfect choice, but what is the best choice I can make? And how do I see how, yes, no, really, everything's connected. And then start with asking myself first, how can I most embody my commitments for the world? And from that place, I can take some fierce ass stands for what I believe in. And I tell people, my commitment is to always come from a place of love and always come from a place of spirit, but that doesn't always mean soft. You know, I'm like, mama bear, you threaten her cub, watch out. <laughs> There's no judgment going on in her mind. She's like, you're messing with my baby. You're going to have to take something about that, you know? And she's like, pow! And she's, there's no judgment. She's just out of love protecting her baby. And so sometimes love can be fierce. It's not always soft and fluffy and teddy bearish. But I have felt, I have experienced in my life, too, that the more committed I am to living in integrity, the more effective I can be in asking others to change their ways. Because... I'm constantly looking at how to make that foundation as solid as possible. And I'm 100% always committed to owning my humanity, owning my mistakes, saying I'm not perfect. You know, you want a list of my faults? I'll give them to you in spades. It's not a problem, you know? And, um, and you're right, like there's, you know, I'm, I'm one of the few well-known environmentalists talking about population and the importance of like Mother Earth has nearly 7 billion children. 
that's a lot of babies for her to be taken care of. And there's only so many resources for taking care of those children. At what point do we recognize that birthing another human being, when you say baby, people freak out. But it's, yeah. it's really about, you know, I'm birthing another human being onto this planet. At what point do we take a look at that? How, at what point do we look at our consumption choices? At what point do we look at our food choices? Like all of these things. and then the military and what it's doing both to people and to the planet. And it can get overwhelming. You know, you start looking at all those threads, it's like, whoa, <laughs> I don't think I can take all that on. Uh, but that to me is just the way I approach it. And I really feel that my best approach is starting first with myself from the inside out and from the ground up. That, that if I look at nature's wisdom, which has been evolving for billions of years, I figure there's some smart things to learn from nature. Nature is about the interrelatedness, and, in, and nature is about the ground up, the inside out. Every, that's how it thrives, and so that's how I try and, and model my awareness and my actions. But what if nature can support more children if we understood her better? I think well, we're, we're going to have to end there. pretty soon, yeah. so <laughs> I thought that was actually a really nice note. <laughs> Maybe wrap it up on there. I want I feel like no one from this side got a yeah. chance. Can we have one I more from this one side? For taking one or two more yeah, yeah, actually, I just want to honor this side. We do have some expenses for this evening and also the work that we do as National War Tax Resistance and trying to do this networking of people in war tax resistance. So I'm actually gonna pass the hat. It's a nice war resistors league broken rifle hat. And um, I hope, and uh, yeah, hopefully people can give whatever they can give if they've enjoyed this evening and the film. And um, there is literature on the table also, and the DVDs are for sale over there. So um, after we're done here, we'll have a little time for that sort of thing. But uh, I'll just start in the back and send this, oh, no, I'll start the front. Um, <laughs> maybe just send this around to other people. I was raised with a preacher for a father, so you just pass the hat, and everybody's encouraged to give what you can give. And see that it comes back to me. That's right, absolutely. Okay. Another couple of questions. And, uh, and I'll, just, I'll just add my, my two cents into it. Like, I, I actually covered my own expenses for being here tonight, and the logistical I incurred of travel and stay and all of that to participate in supporting tonight. So I'm not only my time, but I'm investing real finances as well. And I always encourage people, even if it's literally 50 cents, when you put it in the hat, make a mindfulness thought and or prayer of what that 50 cents investment is going into. Plant a seed of intention with that financial intention as well. And, and I invite people, I always invite people, like literally if all someone has is five cents or 50 cents. And I'm always like, but don't stop there. If you're very, you know, have a lot of wealth, feel free to write a check for five grand, you know, whatever you feel inspired to do. But no matter how little or how much, invest a seed of intention with that investment. Because what I've learned is that where we plant it, it will grow. And so planting in this work growing is a beautiful thing to grow. And planting an intention of what we want to see grow from this work is also a beautiful thing. So thank you to everyone who is planting various forms of seed into that hat. May it grow a more beautiful and healthy and, and thrivable world for all beings. And on this side. Uh, you mentioned the, the period of time when you were in the, the settlement discussions with the corporations and that you became aware that some of the money would go to the federal government. Um, and I, I'm also thinking about, like, you know, nobody just climbs into a tree and decides impulsively to stay there for two years. So I'm wondering, like, the period before that, what, like, were you aware of war tax resistance, not just the choice, but the movement before that time period? And also, you know, also thinking about your comments about being a troublemaker since you were two years old, that, that resonated as well. <laughs> Troublemakers unite. <laughs> <laughs> the, actually, both with the tree sit and with war tax redirection and resistance, I knew almost nothing about either one of them. I mean, I came, I experienced my first experience in the Redwoods in California in um, July of 97. I found out somewhere in that time about both the destruction and the work that was being done to protect them. In August of 97, I was a volunteer at Reggae on the River and a huge music festival every year. That festival is dedicated to a theme that year happened to be dedicated to preservation of the ancient forests. There were amazing speakers and people's tab people tabling. On Sunday night, 
in August of 97, I made a commitment. I'm going to come back here and help these forests. I did not know what, how, when, where. I just knew it was going to help. I went back to where I'd been living. I felt a calling to sell everything I owned. And luckily, I've learned in my life to pay attention to the knowings inside of me and to the intuition. I had no reason to be selling everything I own. People were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm supposed to do this. So I'm paying attention. So I sold everything that I own. Thank goodness. Can you imagine having to worry about your stuff when you're 18 stories up in a redwood? <laughs> I sold everything I owned. I came back out to California. And five days later, I was in a tree. So I, my first climbing lesson, like I climbed trees my whole life, but I didn't climb trees like this, you know? And we climbed similar to the way rock climbers climb. My tree sitting training was at the base of Luna. A rope the size of my thumb comes down from 18 stories up. I can't even tear, tell where it's coming from. This guy is Shakespeare from Detroit. He's so fabulous, love him. He's like, that's your climbing line. You ready to climb? And I'm like, no. <laughs> And he shows me how to put the harness on. He shows me how to tie the prussic knots. He says, this is how you do it. You try it. He undid it. I figured out the ABCs, as they're called, the ABCs of the harness, and putting, tying the prussic notes on. He's like, OK, give it a try. And I start trying. And I look down at him. He says, OK, great. Keep going. <laughs> that was my tree climbing training, literally, as I went up the tree. There was no like up and down two or three times to figure it out. It was just. Okay, good luck. See you next time. Yeah. So, um, and then with vortex resistance, I had, I, it had come kind of into my subconscious awareness, but never really brought forward into my conscious awareness. It was never something that I had been exposed to on a very big level. But when it came to, we're heading into Iraq, I'm about to have to pay $170,000. I can't do that. And then I said, well, what can I do? And that sent me on an inquiry that led me to, oh my goodness, there's a movement. And so that's actually, they're about the same. <laughs> it's like oh, yeah. a need arose. I had to answer the choiceless choice. And luckily with both, there was something for me to step into and become a part of. Oh. <laughs> One more person on this side. I just want to make, I want to just a second, I want to make sure, this side has been quiet the whole time, so I just want to make sure and honor this, this part of the team. I was going to ask you, you spoke to this in part, but you're dealing with like libertarians and even people who don't want to pay taxes. And do they jump on the bandwagon and just try to become part of this effort or this movement? Have you had any issues? Libertarian and who? Libertarians. And who else? And even right wing. Right wing. People. Yeah, I mean, I, especially because my commitment is to find connection with people, I'll find connection wherever there's connection. So if it's like, whatever their reasons are, I'm like, great, you know, become a war tax resistor. Here's the website information, here's the folks contact information, get more involved. I don't, one of the things I've been really mindful of is because I've become well known for what I've done, people then automatically assume that means I'm an expert or a leader. And I'm like, I don't really call myself or consider myself an expert or a leader. I'm just doing what I believe in and inviting others to ask themselves, well, what do I believe in? And I also am very clear that I'm asking others to ask ourselves, where's my comfort zone? And be willing to stretch past that. So that's really what I see my role as. And so I try and plug people. Once people get interested, I try and plug them into the folks who are better experts, who have more experience than I do. I just happen to be crazy enough to do really big, bold things. But that doesn't necessarily, and I try and school myself along the way. I don't. Like in the tree sit, I, I basically put myself through forestry school up there because I, once I realized people were going to ask me my opinion on it, I really wanted to be informed, including I had people on the ground download the website of the logging company I was protesting so I could see what they said about themselves. So I really do try and school myself on things. But at the end of the day, as much as I could possibly learn, I'm not going to be as effective in getting someone plugged in as the National War Tax Resistors Coordinating Committee who's been doing this for a very long time. So that's, that's the way, I, any way I can have of connecting with someone, great. And then I try and channel them into the pathways that are the most effective in getting people engaged. One more. One more. That's what I just, one. I just said, one more, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, I just wanted to kind of echo and, and give a shout out to what you're saying about whole systems thinking and kind of whole systems activism. And, and as much as all these different problems that we see are connected, so are the solutions. So I wanted to see if you wanted to comment 
on the interconnectedness of the solutions and, and you know, what that looks like. The interconnectedness of the solutions. It looks like community gardens uh, in urban areas. It looks like um, creativity being involved and partnering with like people working on the legal and political front. It looks like really good, delicious vegan potlucks where people come together and say, how can we make our, our passions work better together? It looks like walking down the street and smiling at people who have a frown on their face. <laughs> yeah. So thanks everyone for your time and for all of who you are and what you stand for in the world. I know that you're in this room because you care and you are making a stand for making a difference and it's been a total honor and a joy to, to spend the evening with all of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.